Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Underwood, and I'd like to turn it over to Brian Wood, our medical director, to introduce our guest. Great. It's a pleasure to have Jane Marazzo with us today. Uh, Dr. Marazzo is professor of medicine and medical director of the Seattle STD and HIV Prevention Training Center, and she's going to talk to us about HIV and syphilis today. Great. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, it's really, really fun to be here, and I think I recognize some familiar faces on the screen there So, from various AETC updates over the years. So I'll go ahead and get started talking about one of my favorite topics. There are several people in the room here I think have seen a lot of syphilis in the last several years and could probably give a talk. But let's just go ahead and do some really quick brief review, and then I'll give you some updates that I think relate specifically to the HIV-infected patients and the people that you're seeing in your clinics. So just a reminder, when people talk about the stages of syphilis, this slide tries to show you those in a pretty straightforward way. When you see somebody who has a genital ulcer, typically on the genitals, although as we'll talk about later, it actually can occur any place on the body, that's actually an ulcer that's called a chancre, and that's the primary phase of syphilis. And usually that means you've acquired it within the last three weeks, basically up to the last three months. Bottom line is that it means a pretty recent acquisition. If that's untreated in a subset of people, you can go on to develop a secondary phase. And that's the phase that I think people are having the hardest time missing in practice right now. I was just in Boise last week talking to a bunch of providers there, and they told me about a number of young uh, gay men who they had seen as referrals for rashes that were missed, um, actually, as secondary syphilis. So always good to think in a young gay man when you see a rash absolutely in our setting about secondary syphilis. Remember that in the secondary phase, you can see a whole bunch of other symptoms, including fever, neurologic symptoms. You can see hepatitis. Um, you can see lymphadenopathy, all kinds of interesting things. And it really means that the infection is disseminated and very contagious at that setting. If that's not treated, people will generally resolve. Very few, few people actually get incredibly ill during a secondary phase unless they have serious neurologic involvement. It sort of goes into latency, you have no symptoms, and then eventually, many years later, you can have, in an otherwise healthy person, uh, bad outcomes such as the bone disease and the cardiac disease that we hear about and know from a lot of historical records. We call um, latent syphilis the phase without any signs or symptoms, and if we think that was acquired in the last year, that's early syphilis. If it was acquired, we think, greater than a year ago, that would be termed latent syphilis. And, and, syphilis. and as we'll talk about, the reason that's important is that you treat early syphilis different than you treat latent syphilis. And we'll look at that in a second. So just to remind you, and because I can't get through a lunch talk without um, showing some uh, alarming <laughs> photographs, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. This is the primary stage, pretty classic um, shankers. These photos just remind me to say that they can occur not only in a typical location. So the bottom photo there is a perianal shanker, and that was a young man who we saw in STD clinic who was referred to us after being treated for genital herpes uh, for that shanker. So just remember, when you see sort of a raised inner rated lesions with that border. The base is often clean. It's not often very purulent. And classically, it's not tender. You really should think about it. We classically thinking of these, think of these lesions as being single, but you can see in the top photograph there on the penile shaft and the coronal sulcus, there are actually dual lesions, and those are both syphilitic chancres. The other major point to remind you is that you cannot make this diagnosis on the basis of the appearance and complaints alone. Although I said it's classically painless, it's usually not tender, it's usually not purulent, et cetera, et cetera, um, you really can't tell this from herpes or even shank worried, which we don't see anymore for sure. The only time you can really be sure you know what a genital ulcer or lesion is is if you see a vesicle that's really classic for genital herpes. But really for this, it could be any one of the three, so protean manifestations. I think many of you are familiar, especially now, with the classic uh, findings in the secondary stage, the generalized rash, typically macular, papular, pustular. A reminder, though, that I've seen some really interesting rashes lately. We've been confused with things that look like eczema in a more discreet distribution around the neck. Uh, for example, in an older man, I've also seen some disseminated vesicular rashes that people thought were for sure um, a viral kind of disseminated infection like VZV, zoster, or, or herpes. So really any rash, particularly if it involves the hands, the palms, and the soles, deserves your attention. Secondary syphilis, 
also has some other features that I can show you in the next slide, condyloma lata and mucus patches. And I think I already mentioned that this is the type of phase that has a lot of associated or can have a lot of associated secondary uh, manifestations, fever, malaise, lymphadenopathy, et cetera. Um, and also, 25% uh, of people can have recurrent secondary symptoms. After they get better, if they're not treated, that can actually come back. So know that that does occasionally occur. Um, and then these are just some examples. Again, I've seen patients mistreated, in fact, have gotten cryotherapy, liquid nitrogen for these, with providers thinking that they were genital warts. And you can see, looking at those photographs, it's not really that far-fetched, particularly in the top one. But those are condyloma lata, and these are basically incredibly dense um, accumulations of the treponeme and a local reaction. They're highly contagious. They tend to be in any moist body site. I've seen them actually under the breasts uh, in women, in the labia in women, but classically in the perianal area because of those characteristics. And they, they look a little bit like warts, but they're typically more flat topped and a little bit more fleshy. So if you see something that does not look exactly like your classic verrucous wart, then I would definitely think about this. These are also very classically missed. A lot of people don't recognize this. They think that they may be fungal infections, geographic tongue, aphthous ulcers, you name it. But these are mucus patches, and these are basically the same thing as condyloma lata, except they occur in the mouth. Um, they are also very highly contagious. Um, and for those of you who have access to dark field, probably none of you, I think there's only one dark field microscope in our entire region, <laughs> which is in our STD clinic these days. Just remember, even if you had it, you couldn't use the dark field on these lesions because you have oral treponemes in your mouth normally um, that aren't syphilis. So you might see those and think you have syphilis, which wouldn't be good. Uh, but if you see lesions that look funky like this, you're not sure what they are, uh, you should always be taking a good sexual history, but this would make you even perhaps more inclined to do that. And then, of course, neurosyphilis, something that we are all very concerned about, we've seen a lot of, and we've seen some missed cases of, too. Um, sometimes people think of neurosyphilis just as meningitis, but actually there's a whole spectrum of neurologic involvement you can see with this pathogen, treponema pallidum. pallidum. It has a very strong propensity for the central nervous system. Our psychiatric colleagues are here and are very aware that this can happen. Um, the meningitis that happens can be asymptomatic, which is one of the reasons we used to really emphasize doing routine lumbar puncture on um, patients with HIV and syphilis. We have backed off from that now, as I'll talk about. Or you can see a chronic or acute active meningitis. Clearly, that invasion of the central nervous system in the form of meningitis is more common in people with HIV, and it is more common if you have a very high titer of your syphilis serology and or you have a low CD4, less than 250 typically or 350. You can also have some other manifestations too. Meningivascular syphilis can prevent as a stroke. I've seen a couple of patients in the hospital over the years who had a stroke and then had their RPR tested by an astute clinician and it turned out that was what was going on. Classically, the old um, generalized paresis of the insane uh, is the parenchy parenchymatous disease that you can see, and then tabes dorsalis. Those last two are really um, uncommon and mostly occur after many, many years in the un HIV uninfected patient, okay? So let's shift to management after that really quick uh, background. One of the big questions that people have, particularly in the HIV care setting, is when you should consider performing a lumbar puncture in a person with syphilis. Well, this slide just points out that anybody, regardless of their HIV status, who has serological evidence of syphilis should get an LP if they have any neurological symptoms. And I would emphasize that this includes ocular symptoms or auditory symptoms. One of the big things that we are seeing, as I'll mention subsequently, is that people can have hearing loss and prevent with very, present with very subtle uh, cranial nerve eight or eighth cranial nerve dysfunction. They can have mild facials, so cranial nerve seven. Um, those are the two that I would really think about quite a bit. Um, certainly ocular findings, as I'll show you, I think in the next slide, should prompt concern. Anybody who has evidence of tertiary syphilis, we don't really see that too much, although we have seen a few patients um, with HIV who have central nervous system gummas, and those are basically very big 
um, concretions of syphilis in the central nervous system of the brain, and then anybody who doesn't respond appropriately to antibiotic therapy, and we can talk about what that is uh, in a moment. Now, syphilis in the HIV-infected patients has been problematic, and the CDC treatment guidelines have kind of gone back and forth over the years. And you'll also find quite a lot of debate um, if you talk to some experts in this area versus others. I think a couple of points that are really worth knowing, and these are really emphasized in the 2010 CDC STD treatment guidelines, which I've cited at the bottom of the slide, is that CMS invasion in early syphilis, so remember that first secondary phase in particular, occurs pretty commonly whether or not you have HIV or whether or not you have neurologic symptoms. And so if you LP'd everybody who came in with secondary syphilis, you would find a lot of asymptomatic abnormalities in the CSF, and we really don't know what that means. Um, some people think that that should always be treated as, neuro as neurosyphilis. Other people, including the CDC, have come down on the side as saying, you know, there really have not been that many adverse outcomes associated with this as far as we can tell. And so what the CDC um, recommends right now is to not perform LP in HIV-infected patients unless neurologic symptoms are present, recognizing that if your patient fits into that group that has an RPR in particular of greater than or equal to 1 to 32 or a low CD4, less than 350, you're going to have to have an enhanced um, suspicion for the possibility that they may have neurosyphilis. So the bottom line is what they're telling you here is that they want you to avoid a lot of unnecessary LPs because performing those LPs, treating these quote-unquote asymptomatic abnormalities has not really been shown to affect better outcomes in the long term. A very, very intense focus of debate, I would say. Some people here at the University of Washington strongly disagree uh, with these recommendations, and that might be something for us to talk about um, at some point. So I think these are the three approaches you could think about. Um, first of all, you could LP everybody who has HIV, regardless of stage. And that actually was the stance that was advocated in the prior version of the CDC STD treatment guidelines. You could also perform an LP using that algorithm that I mentioned based on the CD4, less than 350, or the high titer, and then treat if the white count is elevated or the VDRL and the CSF is reactive. Remember, the CSF VDRL is insensitive. It's only positive in about 50% of people who we think have neurosyphilis. So all you may have is a lymphocyte predominant pleocytosis, and if that's the case, you probably want to treat it. And then the last option is to LP only if symptoms or signs indicate CNS involvement, and that is the current CDC guidance, which I myself, um, I confess, do tend to do. The caveat, I think, with that last bullet is that it requires a careful history and examination. You can't just sort of eyeball the patient and say the neuro exam is grossly normal. You really have to do a good assessment of auditory function, talk to the patient about their hearing, um, do a decent visual exam, ideally do ophthalmoscopy, and do a good exam of reflexes and um, motor and sensory function, and particularly, as I said before, the cranial nerves. And this is just an example of, I think, um, a couple of papers that have come out. There have been a lot of studies now, mostly case series, um, talking about uh, how common some of these findings are. This is a nice uh, case series of over 500 patients with HIV in France. Um, they looked at basically syphilis prevalence in that population. They had a pretty low prevalence, 4%, not tiny. But of those who did have early syphilis, 20% had ocular involvement, and they showed some of the findings here. Remember, the ocular involvement in um, syphilis is neurosyphilis because you've got optic nerve involvement, and it can be pan uveitis, you can see retinitis, uveitis, um, so a number of, of problems. And then finally, let's just chat about treatment. So penicillin, sometimes when I do these syphilis talks, I really feel like STDs are in the dark ages um, because penicillin has been preferred for the treatment of syphilis pretty much since the advent of penicillin um, in the 1940s. Um, we really haven't changed our primary recommendation at all, and we like to use it, as, if possible, for all stages, so that I mentioned before on that earlier slide. The difference is really in the dosing. If you have early syphilis, so the chancre of primary, secondary syphilis that looks disseminated or early latent, then you can get away with a single dose of intramuscular benzathine penicillin. That's long-acting penicillin. 
You don't want to use other injectable penicillin formulations. They've changed the labeling, so that's not so um, problematic as it used to be, but there are others, particularly the one that's used to treat strep throat occasionally, um, but you don't want to use that. And you don't want to use azithromycin. We were excited about azithro for a while. It does some have, have some activity against syphilis, but it is not, um, hasn't borne out because of resistance. And then if you've got late, latent disease, you need to extend that treatment to three doses given weekly of benzathine, benzathine penicillin. Now remember, you always want to split this dose up, one injection in each buttock, because it really hurts, it's very thick, um, and it's, it's not a pleasant situation. What if you can't use penicillin? You can use all doxycycline and ceftriaxone. And those are listed there. There are optional regimens, actually, also I didn't mention for uh, primary and secondary syphilis. Um, you can use these two drugs for 14 days for those and then for a longer duration for the late latent. I think there's some, there, I mean, there is some literature suggesting that they're equivalent. I would say the data are not great, and if you can help it, you really do want to try to use penicillin. And then just to finish up neurosyphilis treatment, I think most of you know that the standard of therapy is aqueous penicillin given intravenously. We have increasingly used procaine penicillin given with probenicid orally four times a day because you can do that in the outpatient setting. It does require that people come in for an injection every day, which requires a lot of, of effort on everybody's part. And then if you want to, you can use ceftriaxone, but you've got to give that IV daily 10 to 14 days. So really not a lot has evolved in the options for neurosyphilis treatment. So just to wrap it up and hopefully get a discussion going, I would just ask you to remember to have a very low index of suspicion for neuroinvasive disease in our patients. We clearly are seeing a lot of syphilis, as you've heard in this group. We're seeing a lot of neuroinvasive disease, low threshold for performing the LP based on a careful neurologic history and examination. You don't have to treat HIV-infected folks any differently than HIV um, uninfected people, you can use the standard treatment. And then to follow up for treatment, though, you do want to get serologies more frequently in HIV-infected people. You want to get them quarterly for the first year, every six months for the second year. You always want to use the same serology you use to make the diagnosis, and you want to see a fourfold decline in the titer by six months, and that means two titers drop. So 128 goes down to 132, and that really is ideally what you want to see. By a year, most people should be negative or very, very low, and certainly by two years, you'd like to see it gone. Um, I'm going to stop there, I think, and just leave you with this slide, which gives you some resources um, to look up some of this stuff, and you can always contact us if you have questions. So thanks.